That's great. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Uh, my name is Matthew Rowe, and I'm the CEO of the Campaign for Wool in Canada uh, and its parent organization, the Canadian Wool Council. Uh, Many of you, I, I recognize many familiar faces, um, but some of you might not be familiar with the campaign. Uh, the campaign is an initiative of His Majesty the King uh, to promote wool as a natural, sustainable, and biodegradable fiber. We were launched in Canada by their majesties uh, in 2014, back when they were Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall, uh, on a windy pier in Picto, Nova Scotia. Uh, the campaign operates in countries around the world um, based around this, this vision of driving consumer demand. Um, but what really sets apart our work here in Canada uh, is we do, we do that. We do tell the wonders of wool. We have amazing uh, retail and media partnerships that help showcase Again, the incredible versatility of Canadian wool and the Canadians who transform it. Um, but where where we've really started to dig in in the last few years is on how we can really build a sustainable industry and addressing and tackling some of those barriers um, that uh, that are holding the Canadian wool industry back and trying to reimagine what's possible. Um, this is an industry uh, that has been through more downs than ups uh, in, in the last few decades. Uh, and so the, the challenge, of course, is how we create um, a, a profitable wool industry. How do we sustain the infrastructure that we need to do that? How do we bring the people People in the shearers um, uh, and and other um, infrastructure supports that allow for all of that to happen. Um, this is all our, our vision and our, our sort of our, our discoveries and our, um, uh, our our thoughts around what the challenges are and how we are going to tackle them are all outlined in our beautiful wool plan. Uh, we've got uh, the wool plan co-author joining us, uh, Jane Underhill, on the on the call as well. And so feel free if you have questions about strategy, uh, she can speak to that. Um, but uh, it makes for very good bedtime reading. Uh, it's a very very thoroughly researched. Uh, and uh, and and if you you really want to know sort of what the challenges that we face. Um, that is that is the first place you should start. And uh, Alyssa can pop a link in to uh, let you know how how to read that. Um, but uh, but that has really been our guiding light for the fast past few years of how we we grow beyond just promoting wool on the consumer end to again addressing the myriad of challenges that the industry faces, but also the myriad of opportunities. I don't want to sound doom and gloom because again, I think what sets us apart from wool initiatives of the past is that again we are we're very bullish on Canadian wool. We're excited at the at the possibilities of what it can accomplish, whether it's turned into um, the hundred mile blazer that we did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, whether it's turned into blankets, uh, whether it's turned into um, beautiful rugs, um, a felt. Uh, there's there's so many different applications of wool, and I, there's no one I need to. This is the group that I I don't really need to get too deep into that because you know that all too well. Um, but uh, but there's there's a lot of potential, and uh, our organization has been working diligently to clear those barriers, identify the opportunities, and uh, really help Canadian wool to shine. If you haven't seen already, I, I'm going to also ask Alyssa to pop a link into our Fabric of Canada video series. There's probably no better way to kind of glimpse what we're trying to do for Canadian wool than to watch these incredible videos that tell um, stories from across the country about, again, the the amazing versatility of Canadian wool and the incredible Canadians who change it into wonderful products. Um, so I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to check out those those films. Um, we have one on the Hundred Mile Blazer, another on Indigenous Coast Salish weaving, another on needle felting in the prairies in Manitoba, uh, and another on the Knitters of Newfoundland and Labrador. Some of them are very emotional. Uh, the new the Knitters of Newfoundland and Labrador, especially. Um, I, I, I dare you to watch that and not be on the verge of shedding a tear uh, when you uh, hear Yvonne uh, tell her uh, amazing story of, of knitting for the Nonia Knitting Cooperative for 35 years and how she got into it. So anyways, I, I would encourage you to check out those films. We plan to be, be producing more and more of those um, over the coming years, but this is all linked to our, um, our, our vision of rebranding and revaluing Canadian wool alongside Canadian connecting Canadian wool 
to uh, connecting the entire Canadian wool value chain from producer through to consumer uh, and uh, showcasing Canadian wool to the world. Uh, Jane and I on that last point were for the first time we got to meet some of our uh, global wool industry colleagues um, in in December in Nuremberg uh, and uh, and it was really it was a really special moment because for a lot of those people who've been working in the wool industry their entire life they had no no sense of what Canadian wool was <laughs> and what what we could offer um, they knew generally we had wool um, but we just weren't present on that global stage so um, that was a really great opportunity to help to build links identify um, some future business opportunities and really just tell our story because there's a lot of countries that are in the same boat as us in terms of flock size, uh, in terms of um, size of, uh, you know, processing and other available opportunities. So there's a lot that we can learn from the world. So anyways, but you're not here to hear from me droning on. Um, you're here to hear our guest speaker, Catherine Knudsen, uh, is the owner of Small Bird Workshop. Uh, Small Bird Workshop is a Canadian-based yarn and fiber business uh, that sells locally sourced breed specific and Canadian yarns uh, and fibers to crafters all over the world. Uh, Catherine is is a true um, wool enthusiast. She's a hand spinner, a weaver, a dyer, a knitter, a pattern designer, uh, and, and a yarn and fiber specialist. And she loves talking about Canadian wool. Um, we are we're really pleased to have her here. We've uh, participated in uh, in some of her her events previously, so this is uh, this is getting her back to be able to come and now talk to our group. Uh, but uh, we're really looking forward, Catherine, to hearing about your passion for wool, uh, the, the the interesting projects and work that your business is undertaking, uh, and and a little bit about what you see as as uh, the future for for this industry. So uh, without further ado, let me pass it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Matthew. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm a little bit nervous. And as some of you know, I'm just getting ready to move. So <laughs> my stress level is about here. So if I say anything that is nonsense or doesn't make sense, please feel free <laughs> to ask. Um, for I have a presentation prepared for you all. Some of you will have seen portions of it, but I've added a few little new things, developments. Um, if you have questions, you are more than welcome to ask me questions. I'll just ask you to put them in the chat. Alyssa is going to field them for me and she needs to interrupt me, she will. And otherwise I'll just deal with them at the end. Um, I also have brought some uh, fiber samples to show you just to talk about a little bit about what I'm looking for in the wools that I work with, how, what I do on shearing day and um, fiber selection, fleece selection, that sort of stuff. Now, here comes the technology part. Let's hope that everything works the way I need it to. <laughs> Just give me a second to get organized. And I'm going to share my screen. And present. Oops, hang on one second. Technical difficulties. Da -da -da -da. And this is what happens when you have too many things going. There we go. Okay, so presentation. <laughs> um, if you need to reach me at any time, I figure I put this right up front. My website, which is um, often where I put information, it's also where my web shop is, smallbirdworkshop.com. I am on the social medias, um, on Instagram and Facebook. If you need to reach me via social media, Facebook is not the place. I do have a presence there, but Instagram is where I spend most of my time because time is precious and I can only be in one place at one time. Um, I'm also on Ravelry, not as often these days, but you can find me there. And I just realized I forgot to put my email address, but fortunately it is just smallbirdworkshop at gmail.com. And I'm happy to answer questions at any time. Um, I see it as part of what I, the work that I do. Um, so you're always welcome to get in touch. I will try to get back to you as quickly as possible. These days quick um, is sort of an arbitrary um, timeline but I will get back to you as soon as I can. So I started the Small Bird Workshop in 2015 with the initial idea of designing knitting patterns and quickly realized I didn't have the knowledge to design the things that I wanted um, in the way that I wanted because I would be knitting and I've been a knitter since I was, I think I learned to knit when I was six or something like that. Um, I quickly realized that I didn't always know why wool 
the yarns that I was using was were behaving the way I they were. And so I thought the best thing to do was learn to spin. So that was step one. Um, I found myself a local hand spinning workshop. It is the one and only spinning lesson I've ever had, except for a brief plying lesson. I'm hoping to change that. But, you know, one of the things that I do is figure it out on my own, because that's what you do when you're on the left coast of Canada and you don't have all the resources <laughs> available to you. So I learned to spin and it wasn't long, long, whoops, wasn't long after I learned to spin that I realized I really wanted to work with local fiber, but I couldn't find any. So I went to the VIX, which is our local um, fall exhibition, hoping to find some shepherds. And there was a couple there. Um, there were two families doing 4-H. One family has um, had Hampshires and South Downs. And the other family had a mixed breed flock. And so I asked them what they were doing their, their wool. And the people with the South Downs and Hampshires were burning it. And the people with the mixed flock were sending it to the landfill. So that was my moment where I found my purpose in life. It just seemed wrong to me that perfectly good wool was a getting burned because we all know wool is hard to burn. Um, the amount of fuel you have to use to burn wool is atrocious. <laughs> And be, if we can keep it out of the landfills, that's nice. Some of it does deserve to go to the landfill. Now that I've been working in wool a few years, I've seen some pretty gnarly stuff. Um, but in this case, this was a nice flock of really well-raised sheep, and it didn't have a purpose. So I thought, well, I can do that. And then, oh, this is going backwards. Hang on, going forwards. This was, this was my very first yarn festival. That's my husband there on the right. He comes out and helps me. Um, Michael's the busiest human on the entire planet. He runs a multi-million dollar year sales grocery store for um, one part of the Sobeys empire. Um, he's in the Canadian Armed Forces. He serves on the food bank. He's in Rotary International. And he comes and handles cash for me on um, fiber festival days. And sometimes I make him wear his kilt because why not? <laughs> And at this time, I didn't have any Canadian yarns in my lineup. Everything I had was either British or Australian. Um, but it was my goal. First of all, raise some funds so I can start doing the projects that I want to do. And second of all, start finding the people who wanted to try Canadian wool because it is a conversion process, bringing people to what I call the dark side. Um, those of you who are spinners, I'm already preaching to the converted, but you know, the average knitter, if they've only ever known Merino, sometimes the jump to some of our Canadian breed specific yarns is a big jump. So uh, step three. So that first fiber festival was in May of 2019. 2020, my entire life changed. I had a full year of fiber festivals plans and all the inventory and stock to, to go to them. And literally on the day that British Columbia closed down was <laughs> the day that I had my very first fiber festival of the season. And all of a sudden, like everybody, yeah, I had to figure out how to run a small business online um, and hope that I didn't go bankrupt before I'd even really started. Fortunately, the people of the internet stepped up and what happened for me, um, which was a true blessing is my business quadrupled and then it could you put again. <laughs> and I have had steep learning curves that I have not planned on having, like how to ship huge amounts of yarn all over the world in a very short period of time, where to find shipping materials, how to do it in a way that makes sense to me in terms of sustainability, um, all these sorts of things. But what COVID also did for me is all of a sudden people had no place to sell their fleece and I could find them online. And although in person, I'm a fairly shy person and I've had to learn how to be more extroverted, um, I'm really good at sending random emails to people and never expecting a reply. <laughs> um, and fortunately for me, I did get replies. So one of the, the events that was canceled was the Lower Mainland Sheep Auction. What they did instead is published a list of where people could buy their fibers. And the very first person I got a hold of was Susan Russell of the Barnston Island Flock. So for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen lots of photos of this beautiful flock. It is a fiber flock. And one of the reasons why I'm so fortunate to have this as the first flock that I work with is their fleeces are immaculate. Susan um, and John Russell um, put 
incredible effort into the quality of their fleeces. They routinely win prizes at the Lower Mainland Fleece Auction. Um, I go there on shearing day, I skirt with them, we consult about um, what we're seeing in terms of genetics because we've had some issues, environmental issues actually. Barnston Island is a little island located between Port Coquitlam and Surrey, it's right in the middle of the Fraser River, and it is home to the Catsea First Nation, several cranberry farms, an organic dairy and the Barnston Island flock. But because it's on this island, they have to deal with flooding. Um, their pasture is really, really rich and lush for most of the year. Um, and that means that their sheep get way more nutrition than they need. And we actually see that in the quality of the fleeces. So sometimes their fleeces are a high, higher micron count than ideal, simply because they're getting so many nutrients from the really rich pasture. The other challenge for the Barnston Island flock is they have to deal with flooding. We actually had a case this spring where, or not this spring, this winter, where there were some king tides then they were in danger of losing their hay stock um, for the entire year. It didn't happen, but it's a challenge when you've got a small flock that lives on an island. Um, Susan has a mixed breed flock. And for me, that's not a bad thing because mixed breed flocks, she's been breeding in the best properties. And you can see with that little fleece there on the right, I'm not sure who that is, but that's some pretty nice looking um, locks there. So she's got CVM, Romney, BFL, and Gotland in her genetics in her flock. And these are some of the faces. Um, that's Daisy on the right and Bella, oh, sorry, Daisy on the left and Bella on the right. And one of the nice things about working with this flock I've worked with Susan and John for three years now, and we're starting to build up a record of what we're seeing in their fleeces. They consult with me about breeding. Um, they have some special fleece in their flock. They have a, a sheep named Muffin. Muffin is a almost, almost purebred Romney with a particularly fine fleece. And so we're breeding Rom, um, Muffin to see what kind of offspring she has and what their fleece looks like in terms of their genetics and the fleece quality. And Oh, the other thing I really like about the Barnes and Island flock is their fleeces are pristine. There is no VM in them. And one of the reasons is they have a really smart feeding system. Um, this guy in the center, that's Pog. Um, and what they do is they have their sheep on the slat work system. So feces and urine and chaff drop through underneath when they can then take it off and use it for composting. And the sheep can't get into their um, feed troughs, which is what they have there in front. That keeps the hay off the sheep, which is the most important thing when you're dealing with fiber is keeping the hay off the sheep because most farming systems in Canada have to feed hay. That's just part of what, what we deal with. Our pastures aren't great in the winter time and in BC especially here on the West Coast, we deal with mud and sheep trotting in mud destroys the root systems of the pasture. And so in wintertime, everybody gets fed inside so that it's preserving the root structure of the um, pastures because that's really important both in terms of nutrition and in terms of carbon sequestration. So whenever I've been starting to take photographs of who's doing a good job with their feeding so people can get ideas about how to keep their sheep clean. It's really not that hard. Now this, let's see if this happens. This is shearing day on Barnston Island. This is uh, Joanna Walker who regularly shears on Barnston Island and um, she's often complains about the chubby sheep. <laughs> but what I really like about Jo, she's a farmer herself so she raises dorsets and she's a very smooth shearer so I get very few second cuts in the fleeces. Second cuts are when the shears have to go over a section again. And um, it's not ideal in the fleece. Second cuts are what gives us neps and noils and neps and noils turns into pills. And then people complain about pills and we don't want people complaining. We wanna keep people happy. happy. So Joanna um, is really smooth. She takes her time with the sheep. She's not the fastest shear in the world and I don't care because what I get from her shearing is good quality fleece and at the end of the day that's the important thing, good quality fleece. The other thing is here you can see how clean the setup is because John and Susan have been doing this for a long time. The shearing platform is swept between each sheep. Um, the sheep generally get their hooves or hooves feet checked at the same time and trimmed. Everything gets swept. We do skirting over to the side. Um, so everything is kept neat, tidy, 
bagged, organized, weighed. And this is something that you don't see on every farm. I'm gonna show you a photo a little later on of um, fleeced Armageddon <laughs> where the sharing platform isn't ideal. Um, but this is what I like to see. Skirting's be um, belly and bridge is going off to the side so that they're keeping it out of the prime area of the fleece. And we've got one sheep handler who you can't see, one person handling it, the, the sweeping of the area. Someone else does the fleece flow throwing over to the side where I am on skirting table with a couple other friends. So it's a science on Barnston Island. We've got it down to a crew that comes every shearing. Susan shears about three times a year um, because that's ideal for the type of fleeces that she's raising. If you don't shear on a regular basis, you'll get fleeces that are too long or um, fleeces that caught and caught is felting on the sheep. And if you, I have a cotted fleece, I just can't use it. Also allows us to keep a really good eye, eye on um, the conditions underneath the fleece to prevent things like scurf, which is a mite infestation. Scurf produces dandruff, fish stuff. It's not really dandruff, but it's like dandruff that sticks to the fleece and makes a fleece unusable. And if you send a scurfy fleece to the mill, they yell at you. So because we have parasite issues on the West Coast because we don't get freezes, um, shearing that frequently allows us to keep the staple length where we want it and make sure that the sheep are in excellent health because healthy sheep produce good wool. Um, another flock that I work with are these lovelies. These are Shropshires. Um, they're from a small farm in the Vernon area and they are adorable. Um, and Katrine Stetler is another one of these really enterprising people because most sheep farmers can't just do one thing. Most of them have day jobs off the farm. And Katrine happens to be a Crown Prosecutor in her part time. Um, she also raises cider apples and she's got horses and then she's got this flock of about 40 purebred Shropshires. And the reason why I like Shropshires, um, they're a down breed and down breeds are naturally resistant to felting. And for me, I sell a lot of my yarn and spinning fiber to people who spin for socks. Socks need to be washed more frequently than say a sweater. And if it's naturally resistant to felting, technically it could go through an average load of laundry. And I have done that accidentally and things have been okay on the other end. Downbreed sheep include things like Suffolk's and Hampshire's and Dorset's and Oxford's and South Downs. And they are traditionally an overlooked fiber. Spinners know that they're a great fiber to spin. They are super elastic. They are um, not always the softest, but you don't want softer socks necessarily, in my opinion. I actually think Merino yarn for socks was really, really dumb. Um, unless you like your socks to fall apart, maybe some people do. Um, I don't, and because I hand knit socks, I really like them to last because hand knitting socks is not a small enterprise. So we've started a spinning Anne Katrine's um, yarn or wool into sock yarn. Um, I did my first batch last year at Wellington Fibers. I'm collecting 40 pounds of it from her brother. Um, who's about an hour south of me, she dropped it off there in the fall, <laughs> and it's been sitting there waiting for me to come and get it, so I picked that up on Friday, I think, and also they're adorable little sheep. She raises them mostly for meat, so that's a nice one that they've got a du dual purpose, um, they're a dual purpose breed, and this is her feeding system, where she keeps her <laughs> sheep out of the hay by using these troughs. And it's no hardship going to Anne Katrine's farm because look at that view. She's in Oyama, which is just north of, um, just south of Vernon and not a hard place to go and visit. That's for certain. Uh, another new flock to me are the Mendoza Rambolais. So Rambolais are a fine wool breed. We don't have very many fine wool breeds in Canada. Rambolais is probably the most well represented of our fine wool breeds. And Allison um, is raising them for both meat and fiber, but she's a weaver. So um, when I contacted her and I actually found her through Alberta lamb, which is a very strange co coincidence because I thought I was emailing a shepherd in Alberta and it turned out that she's in Vernon. Um, she is raising them for fiber and meat. And she was already sending her fleeces off for testing, micron testing. So her fleeces are testing a about 20 to 21 microns, depending on um, nutrition. She's changed her nutrition so that she, this year she should be getting a lower micron count. And the creature off to the left is Spooky the Llama. Most of my flocks have some sort of guardian animal. In BC, our biggest predator, actually, 
are not any of our wildlife, it's dogs. Um, we Farms out here have terrible problems with people letting their dogs roam and a dog will go through a flock and rip them to pieces and it's awful and it's heartbreaking. Um, Spooky the llama, he looks nice and cute and gentle. He has teeth of, stain, of stainless steel and he will take you down um, if you threaten his, his flock. I'm slightly terrified of llamas. <laughs> Alpacas, not so much. Llamas are pretty scary. Other guardian animals that I see, Barnson Island has two donkeys named Sparky and Dorothy. And they keep, they have bears on Barnson Island, so Sparky and Dorothy keep the bears away from the flock. And other people have guardian livestock dogs of a variety. Um, here on Vancouver Island, the other big predator we have is cougars. Um, we, Vancouver Island has the largest population per square uh, mile of cougars in all of the entire world. So cougars are a big problem, but they're not as big as problem as domesticated dogs. And this is one of Allison's little Corydale Rambouillet lambs. So she has not been able to find a, ram, a purebred Rambouillet lamb or ram that isn't closely related to her flock. So she's crossing with Corydales right now. And I'm hoping to help her change that situation. Although her Corydale ram, his name's Murphy, and he is lovely. He likes scratches and cuddles. And he also has a really nice fleece. So that's always a bonus. I kept Murphy's fleece for myself this year. So that's always a sign when the fiber person is keeping a fleece for themselves, that it's a nice fleece. Uh, <clears throat> a flock that I've now worked with several years is here on Vancouver Island called um, Cedar Meadows Ranch owned by Mary and Wayne Shad. Now the thing with Mary and Wayne and the thing with John and Susan Russell and Barnes and Island is all of them are seniors. Um, John turns 80 this year and Mary and Wayne are getting close to that age. And I'm seeing this in most of my fiber flocks that our farmers are getting older and their farms are going to be going up for sale at some point because at some point I'm sure they'll want to retire. And then what happens? We don't have young farmers who are able to afford the, these beautiful farms in BC. And those who do start flocks, I'm seeing more and more hair sheep as being the popular choice because people don't have to deal with shearing with hair sheep. So they think they actually do, but, um, but hair sheep, you know, a popular breed here in Vancouver Island is the Barbados black belly, which makes no sense to me. Why would a sheep from the Barbados be good for Vancouver Island? Um, I don't know. So, um, I'm hoping that by doing this and working with these already established flocks, that'll help the next generation see that wool sheep are um, viable. Um, Mary and Wayne have a small flock now. They have about 40 sheep. They used to run in the hundreds, but they also have a cattle farm. And they also, in addition to their 25 acre farm, um, lease another 40 acres and farm it in hay. And they're pushing 80. I think they're both in their late 70s. <laughs> they're incredible people. Um, this is Michael handling one of their great big Romney rams. And there's something, Romney is one of my favorite breeds of wool. We have special Romney here in Vancouver Island um, because it's really crimpy. It's really lovely. And I see a hand up. Jane, did you have a question? I did have a quick question before. Mm -hmm. Before you went too far, you say that a lot of the um, these fiber farmers are retiring. Is it because they got into fiber fiber farming later in life as maybe a retirement project, or no. what do you think that's all about? Um, well, in the terms of the the shads have been on their farms. Well, I actually went to school with their boys. It's weird, weird how these things sometimes come full circle. Um, their farm is not far from where I grew up, and they've been farming since the eighties and. Um, I believe Susan and John are the same, that they're long-term farmers. They just don't have succession planning because, you know, Mary and Wayne's farm, they probably bought it for $10,000 in the 80s, and it's now probably worth, I don't know, $25 million? <laughs> um, Real estate on Vancouver Island is bizarre. Um, we were hoping with, with the move that we had have coming up that we'd be able to find a small acreage um, somewhere between one and three acres, and we simply couldn't afford it with our budget, which was over a million dollars. Um, nothing with, was worth looking at under two million. <laughs> if it was under two million, it was a knockdown, and that's for one to three acres, um, and not always prime land. So prime farmland on Vancouver Island is really, really valuable, and the same thing in the lower mainland. So if they have kids that are interested in purchasing the farm, they simply can't afford it. 
Um, so that's the big challenge is these family run farms um, are gonna be sold off at some point and it's probably gonna be people who maybe monoculture, I don't know what will happen to this particular farm. Ideally, I'd love to be able to buy it myself, but that's not in the cards. So, <laughs> um, but I don't think any of them are going to be retiring yet. They all seem to be still out there throwing sheep around. Um, yeah. And I mean, when I say throwing sheep around, I mean it like this, this guy in this photo with Michael. So my husband's about six feet tall. Um, this sheep is about 350 pounds. And I think it's on the next screen. Oh, that's their feeding system. Again, the shads, reason why I work with them, pristine fleeces. And they don't raise, like they happen to have nice fleece. They don't raise their sheep for fleece, um, but they have this really great feeding system that just keeps the sheep out of the hay. It's really not that hard. <laughs> um and they are also set up for cattle which doesn't like doesn't is not a hardship the cattle feeding system they have works really well for their sheep um just turn this down a sec so this is peter um des moines shearing one of their rams and peter is i'd say six six foot four and you can see how big that sheep is so like it's another challenge is just people handling large breed sheep um, Peter's making it look really easy here. On this particular day, one of the rams gave him a run for his money. It took three of them to get the ram down. Um, usually Romneys are really docile and friendly sheep, but that's the other challenge for these people who are getting later in life. They have big sheep <laughs> and handling a 350 pound ram when you're 75 years old is dangerous if it's not a well-behaved ram. So they're having to make choices. For example, Susan and John are choosing to go into smaller sheep. Um, they were we were talking about um, what to do with breeding because they don't own a ram currently. They'll bring in a ram from somewhere else. And we were talking maybe Shetland, maybe Icelandic. I hope they don't go to Icelandic. It's not really my decision to make, but it's something that we talk about. Um, now, I don't always get to work with flocks in person. Um, sometimes I luck out and find flocks further afield and Crow Hill Corydales in Ontario is one of them. Um, Crow Hill is run by Leslie Diamond. She lives next to Mariposa Fiber Firm where they have a small mini mill. Um, they run Belfast mini mill equipments. And so she delivers her beautiful Corydale, which is really nice and soft to the mill for me, which is excellent. I've never actually seen her fleeces in person. I do have samples from this year's fleeces, which is always nice because then I actually get to see what I'm looking at. Um, but in these cases, I often rely on the mills for helping me make decisions in terms of processing because right now I don't get time to travel. I'd like to, I'm hoping to get out to Ontario and see some of these flocks in person. But I happen to know, and this is some more of Leslie's sheep. Leslie does raise for fiber in addition to meat. And she's won prizes at the Royal Ontario Winter Fair for her fleeces. So it's always a good indication. Now, this is Comfort Tunis, and some of you lucky people in the crowd will have got some, some of the fiber from this flock. Comfort Tunis is not is in Cardinal, Ontario. They're not far from um, Mariposa Fiber Mill as well, so they drop off for me. And I found them during COVID. So Tunis are a North American breed developed from Tunisian sheep. They are naturally caramelly, soft, cinnamony brown color, and this is an example of what I don't want to see on shearing day. So Mark and Bep are lovely people, but they know, knew nothing about their wool. They just knew it was nice because the shearers were telling that. And this is what a shearing platform is not ideally supposed to look like. With You can see down at the bottom of the picture, there's some hooves down there and it hasn't been swept. And this is common to for what I see for a lot of flocks, that the shearers are just trying to get through things as quickly as they can. They put no value in the fleece. And the thing is, this is really nice wool. Really nice wool. Um, I'm pretty sure Bobby has had some and I know Glenda has, I think has had some of the, this tunis. Um, it's lovely and they had been garbaging it so when I contacted Mark and Bev they were initially totally surprised which is a common reaction when I get a hold of shepherds they think who is this crazy woman from British Columbia contacting me about my will and what does she want and so we were been working for a couple of years now trying to get their wool clip better and they're really great to work with I taught them 
um, skirting online. Um, they've been changing their marking system. Um, they still, you know, there's still work to do. It would be ideal if I could actually go there and work with them one-on-one, -on -one, but I can't, so we do the best we can. And Mariposa has been really great about knowing that they're going to have to do some skirting when they're processing the pieces. Um, but they seemed happy to do that for me. I pay them a little extra for that, of course, because it is extra work for the mill. Um, but this is the reason why. <laughs> so those are the lambs on the left and they're an extraordinary natural color. And if I don't have to dye wool, it's a happy day for me. And then on the right, that's one of their um, sheep at the Royal Ontario Winter Fair where they do get um, prizes for their meat sheep. Um, the wool is a new thing that we're working on together. And I think, I know that um, I've got a batch that's just getting finished up at the mill in Kamloops and I have already purchased their clip for this year. So it's one of the things that I work towards. I, if the farmer's willing to work with me to develop better fleece, I will try to buy their entire clip, which means for one year, they do not have to worry about where their shearing fees are coming from. And they're gonna pay for some of their feed costs as well. So it's a win-win. And as it, they improve their clip and I can charge more for the products that I'm selling, I can pay them more. And I did that this year for the first time where someone said, I want X dollars a pound. And I said, I'm not paying you X, I'm paying you X plus an extra $3 because I know I can sell your fleece and I've got people waiting for it. So that is a happy day for me. Oh, <laughs> sorry, this is the fiber getting spun <laughs> at the Mill and Cam Loops. Um, so that is the actual Tunis fiber that we blended with some Honey Tessa silk. Um, the Cam Loops mill's really great about taking photographs of processing for me. Why it is so huge, I don't know, but this is what it actually looks like getting spun. So it preserves that sort of creamy, warm, yummy vanilla milkshake color. And then this is it if the video, uh, I'll skip that. Um, Nicole sent me a video of it getting plied as well. Um, now, another firm that I work with, these are the um, Raven Hill Cheviots, um, which is a local flock to me. So Cheviots are another one of these sheep breeds that get discounted for their wool because it's not super soft but it is really great for things like socks. So bulk of my business has turned into sock spinning, sock wool, sock yarns. And Cheviots were um, the breed of sheep traditionally used in the border, border region of Scotland and England for kilt hose. This is where they came from. These are North County Cheviots. This uh, flock is a breeding flock. So she just breeds for breeding stock. She um, sends her rams off to other flocks in Canada and the United States. And again, just her wool right now is not getting used. She is saving it. She knows that it has a value. So she has this workshop with tons of it in there. And I simply don't have the capacity to buy it all. It's the biggest struggle that, one of the biggest struggles right now. I don't have the funds to buy it all. And I don't have the places to sell it uh, or to send it. My, the mills that I work with, are great. I work with some really excellent mills, but they're small and they're telling me that I, I am maxing them out. So Mariposa Fiber, the first time I sent fleece there, it took them about eight months to turn around. Right now, they're at about a year and a half for me. And because I send a lot there, I do generally get put closer to the front of the line. Wellington Fibers have told me I am maxing them out. They cannot take more fiber from me. I have started using exotic fibers in Alberta, but they're up for sale. And it's a real conundrum because, um, yeah, where do I send it? I can't send it to the Belfast mini mills. They're too small. They can't process well, fast enough. And so ideally what I need is mid mid-sized mills um, because I can't meet the minimum quant quantities of the big mills like um, Briggs and Little or Lemia. They require a 2000 pound minimum. I cannot do that financially. So I'm going to be looking at, I was talking to um, a woman in the United States named Jean Carver, who runs Shanique Cobble. Um, she does, has a similar model to what I'm trying to do. And she's given me some suggestions, but I'm going to have to go to the United States for some of my milling. I just can't get it done in Canada. And the other problem is we don't have true worsted mills in Canada. For So for sock yarn, what I want is a four ply worsted spun, and I cannot get that 
in Canada. Um, the one mill that said that they're Canada's only worsted mill is not. <laughs> I went there, they only have a pin drafter. They don't have a comber. So I don't know why they're billing themselves as that because you need a comber to be worsted. And I just don't believe in sock yarns that come from roving. Um, roving is one, spinning from roving is always, always going to give you a woolen spun yarn. Um, it'll be some degree of woolen um, because preparation is what determines what a yarn, final yarn will be. So how it's prepared, whether it's roving, pin drafted roving or combed top um, determines if it's going to be woolen, semi worsted or worsted, um, regardless of how it's spun. And I just don't believe those type of yarns are the best for socks. Um, they're also not the best for weaving. Um, they have lots of great properties. Woolen spun yarns are lofty and warm and bouncy and light, but they're not tough wearing. And for socks where there's lots of abrasion, that's what you need. Also, my mills in Canada can't give me a true four ply. We're trying um, with the mill in Kamloops. She's trying her hardest to get me a sock weight four ply. I just don't think we have, she's gonna be able to do it. At least she's willing to try, which is something. However, it is a huge problem when I'm competing with, um, you know, milling systems from other parts of the world that can produce these types of yarns. And, smooth, consistent, um, without naps and noils, without slubs. Yeah, that's one of my big challenges. It's not that our mills aren't doing a good job. It's just they are restricted by the equipment they have. And yeah, that's one of my huge struggles in what I do. This is another fiber flock. Mostly, I just like showing people pictures of the sheep. Um, that's Ibrahim on the left and Eugene on the right. <laughs> And they're Romneys and they're lovely. Ibrahim's fleece is currently at Wellington Fibers right now. And another small triumph for me is Wellington Fibers actually contacted me to get their contact information of this flock um, because they liked their Romney so much that they had someone who was looking for a Romney ram in Ontario and wanted me to put them in touch with this flock in BC because good rams are hard to find and it's, farmers are happy to transport sheep across surprisingly long distances. And Twin Oaks is another farm in Ontario that I work with. I um, don't have any pictures of their sheep. I do have a picture of Clarence. <laughs> this is Clarence from a new farm um, that I'm working with. And same sort of idea that we're starting small, getting their fleece out there, seeing how people respond to it. Um, Walnut Hill Farm is run by Christine Stevens. Her daughter happens to be a, a, veterinary who, a veterinarian who specializes in sheep health who's just finishing up her education in um, Ireland, will be coming back. So I'm really excited about this. Um, these are some more of the Walnut Hill farm sheep um, because this is what they produce. These beautiful natural colored um, rovings wool. And I know in the grand scheme of things in terms of international wool, white is king. But for me, I'm um, doing the small batch stuff. I, if I don't have to dye it, it's a happy day. And even over dyeing gray gives you a whole range of color that's not possible with white white wool. Um, I'm hoping to see people start to look at what at colored wool as um, a more interesting option because it gives you, even when you're dyeing, a depth of color and um, vibrancy that you just cannot get with pure white wool. Uh, I think this is my final flock that I'm showing you. So. I don't just work with Canadian flocks, I work with other people in the world. This is a small flock of Beaumont Merinos in Cornwall, England. And um, Laura works with actually one of my major suppliers. She works there part-time, um, but she also has this beautiful flock of Beaumont Merinos and Rylands and some BFL crosses. And I'm gonna be showing you um, some locks from one of her, from one of her rams. Beaumont Merinos were developed by the Scottish Agricultural Board for uh, fine wools that could be raised in Great Britain. And that is interesting to me because here on Vancouver Island, people say you can't raise fine wool sheep. And it's true. Um, the CVMs that I've seen here really suffer from the, the humidity that we have. And that shows up in the fleece as yolk staining. And so you don't get white fleece, you get yellow fleece. It's not a problem if you're dyeing it well, ish. If it's yellow, it means that you're working with that base color and you can't dye, say, a light gray or a light blue. They'll both come out green. 
Um, but the other problem is yolk staining is a sign that the animal isn't happy in its environment. Um, shearers will tell you that any of the fine wools, Rambouillet, CVM, um, the occasional merino that we come across are what they call the saddest sheep <laughs> that they see here on the West Coast. They do better in the interior because it's more arid, but this is showing that you can raise fine wools in more humid environments if they're bre bred with the proper breeding um, selection in their genetics. And that creature there on the right, that's you and their beautiful ram with an impressive set of horns. And I've purchased Ewan's fleece for two years in a row now because it's that nice. It tests at 19 microns. It's just extraordinary. And it has a ping test like you wouldn't believe. So a ping test is a way that I test for strength. That gives me an idea of how I can get the fleece processed because if it's not strong um, and it's not done the right way, the mill will rip it to shreds. Not intentionally, of course, that's just what happens. Um, so ping testing is something that I always do with fleeces to make sure that they're sound and can handle processing. Now, here we go into science. How am I doing with time? Oh, okay, I've still got a little bit of time. Um, I generally try to take samples from the fleeces that I'm working with and send them off for micron analysis. So on the left is what we call the histograph and on the right is, oh, what do we call it on the right? Can't remember. But they show me two things. The histograph is showing me um, the percentage of fibers that fall within a certain micron range. And you can see that nice bell curve. That's what it should like. These are from two of the sheep in the Barnston flock. And so I've been doing this for three years now. And we can take a look and see how those fleeces are doing as the sheep age. Because as a sheep ages, you're going to get a higher micron count because lamb's wool, the first clip, is always the finest. And then as the sheep ages, the thickness of the fiber goes up from there. And it's showing me a other, few other things, um, standard deviation, um, the CF is comfort factor. So that's showing the percentage of fibers that are under 30 microns. I actually don't think it's a really good indication of comfort factor because what we don't have in our North American laboratories is an indication of compression factor, which does play a role in comfort factor. And comfort factor is how that fleece is going to be against the skin. Um, what I am particularly interested in is though is the graph on the right and that is showing the development of the fiber from when it was first shorn to when it was then comes off the fleece. So on the left that indicates the tip of the, of the fiber and that's the tip from when the sheep was last shorn and then on the right that's the butt end of the fiber from when it was shorn and this current shearing. And it shows those dips and troughs. Often that's an indication of nutrients. So I expect to see a dip over the winter season. But what we're also trying to um, get an idea of is how things like the heat dome that we've had in British Cumbria has impacted the fibers. How um, fire season impacts the fibers because the Barnston Island flock gets socked in um, during fire season and they don't see daylight for weeks on end. Um, how humidity and flood seasons are affecting the fibers. Right now, this is st still early days in the, um, the gathering of data from this particular flock. Um, but what I want to see is, the, is what the upper one is, much more consistent. Bluebell, Bluebell may have had, um, I can't remember for sure, but I suspect this year, from this shearing, she had a lamb. And you'll see that in the fiber. So if the uh, sheep is pregnant, um, it degrades the quality of the fiber because they're putting all their nutrients into the actual lamb. And sometimes it shows up as a break in the fiber. So a weak spot, um, which may be what's happening right here with this little dip that could be right around lambing where every single thing, every single nutrient is going into the lamb rather than the wool. Um, this is the other half of the report that I get back from from the lab and I'm sending my samples at the moment to Montana State. It's the closest to me. They're reasonable. I'm not 100% sure how accurate they are because I've had some weird results, but they are what I have to work with and so this is what I get back from them. And it costs me about, depending if I've ordered a histogram, between three and four dollars per sample. So it makes it feasible for me and um, I'm hoping to be able to add a micron analyzer to my equipment kit, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, I think for the rest of it, I just have stuff about the, the um, 
different things, different mills I work with. I'm just going to skip through that. What I wanted to show you, though, <laughs> before I open to questions, um, one of the things that's really important to me is traceability and um, transparency. And not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about um, mileage in Canadian wool. So on Vancouver Island, we don't have a mill here anymore. Yeah, our, my closest mill is in Kamloops, which is about 350, 400 kilometers away from me. And um, a friend and I were talking about green splaining um, or green um, taking marketing terminology and making things seem more environmentally friendly than they actually are. And we're, I was talking, we were talking about someone who was doing some of this and she said, well, at least it's better than China, the getting stuff from China. And something didn't sit right. So I did some digging. And so this is um, the carbon footprint of shipping wool from Sydney, Australia, which is where a lot of wool gets shipped from, to Shanghai, which is where a lot of wool gets processed. Um, it goes by sea. And I put it in for 100 kilograms of wool, because that is not abnormal and an abnormal amount that I'm transporting. It comes out to four to five kilograms of carbon for that distance. Not bad, right? I was surprised. That's pretty low. Here's what I was really surprised at. This is me driving 100 kilograms of wool from my home in Nanaimo to Kamloops. So it generates, and this is one way, <laughs> 1.4 1 kilograms of carbon. Also not bad, but that's only 300 kilometers. <laughs> Shanghai, Sydney to Shanghai is 8,000 kilometers. <laughs> so this year I took a run of, of wool to um, exotic fibers in Innisfil, Alberta. Just about the same amount of carbon <laughs> as it takes to transport wool from Shanghai to uh, uh, Australia to Shanghai. Just about the same. Here's what really stunned me. This is me shipping wool from Vancouver Island to Alora, Ontario by air. It has to go by air. Do you see those numbers? <laughs> 259 kilograms of carbon. <laughs> to ship across Canada. I, I was sick to my stomach. Absolutely sick, grossed out. Holy cow, here I am patting myself on my back about the great job I'm doing with getting local yarn. And that's the carbon footprint of it one way. Approximately, what, five, 100 times more than shipping it from Sydney to Shanghai. Holy cow. I have got to do a lot better. So fortunately, I talked to Jane about some things that I can do. Um, I'm looking at rail shipping. I'm looking at if I can ship to Wyoming, which is where one of the mills I work with in the States is, it's better than shipping it all the way across Canada. But this is part of the um, aspect of carbon footprint and about low mileage and about um, local that we don't talk about. Um, it's quite stunning. I, I'm still a little bit boggled when I look at this. And in case you're wondering what TW, TTW TT, um, and WTW is, TTW is tank to wheel. I wrote this down because I wanted to make sure I could just reference it. Here it is. Tank to wheel, from the gas tank to the, to the wheel of the vehicle. Um, WTW is from the well to the wheel. So from the, where the oil is taken out of the soil to the wheel of the vehicle. And I have put in like variables for the fact that if I'm transferring from Vancouver Island, I do have a little bit of sea travel in there, but this shows that sea travel is always going to have, or sea freight is always going to have a lower environmental impact than air by a bizarre amount. And yeah, rail, the, the slower the route, um, and the more cargo being transported at one time is going to have a lower environmental impact and a lower cost as well. It's sort of just economics 101. So I wanted people to see that because this is a new thing to me. This is, I've only been looking at this in the last month or so. And people will say, yes, but wool um, sequesters carbon. And it does. The average sheep will sequester about half a kilogram of carbon. That's from data that's come from the New Zealand um, wool board, the research that they're doing. So not enough to offset these kind of emissions. Yeah, anyhow, there's my bad news. It's always good news, bad news with Canadian 
<laughs> we want to do well, but we have no mills. We want, we have all this beautiful wool, but we have no place to send it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my life, figuring out how to do these things creatively and with no budget and, <laughs> but creative is what I do. So onwards we go. So yeah. Those are the things that I've been looking at, and I think we have some questions. Yeah. Um, did you want to do um, the microscope? Show us if you didn't want to. Um, I can. Do we, would people like questions, answers to questions first, or do you want to take a look at some samples first? Maybe if we could, just, if we could do questions. I'm just conscious of of time for people, yep. so I, I um, yep. that we're a little bit over. So yeah, and I'm happy to stay on if. I know that some of you need to run away, um, but if I'm happy to stay if you people want to look at lock samples afterwards. So questions first? Okay, um, Matthew and I will moderate the questions. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, you can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and Matthew and I will ask them. Um, we did have a few from the, during the presentation. <laughs> Um, and a few comments. Um, Sylvia said that, as far as I understand, the Barbados black belly was resist a bit more resistant to the barber pole worm. And she says that that's a bit of a problem on the island, island in lower mainland. So maybe that is why they have those sheep there. Um, um, it could be. Um, I haven't spoken to anybody who's like I don't generally work with those flocks, so I don't know what the reasoning is. I know for a lot of people, though, it's simply due with due to shearing that they're making those choices mm -hmm. due to shearing, and if they happen to be resistant, I think that's probably a bonus. Again, I don't know that for certain because I haven't. I don't. Those aren't flocks I tend to work with. So, um, Sylvia is also asking if you can recommend any online resources for improving skirting techniques. I can't, but I'm hoping to do some videos myself because. I skirt a lot of things. <laughs> um, and so I'm hoping to do some skirting videos where I actually walk through like a completely raw off the sheet fleece that's only had rich and belly removed. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, comment from Karen. Thank you for your work you do to encourage wool growth in the industry for CDA. Yeah. And Marge says, um, she was just a bit confused about why, um, just with the amount of carbon that's being put out there and with the numbers, um, and why it's, um, higher for across Canada than, um, the wool from Australia to Shanghai, um, unless the wool from Australia to Shanghai is going by boat. Yeah, it is. It's going by sea. Okay. And so most of the large um, importers that I work with, because I do bring in wool from other parts of the world. Um, I stock a lot of Falkland Island wool because they have incredible welfare standards for both their sheep and for um, their environmental standards. And so that's always coming by sea. And so the big importers, um, so in the, in the craft sector, there's a few importers that we have where they bring in huge amounts of wool or, and yarn and then wholesale to independent buyers. And all of that is coming by sea. And then once it arrives at port, it's going by land. Whereas when I'm shipping across Canada, it's going by air. And that's the only way I can get it there at the moment. However, Jane has sent me some leads on how I can change that. So we'll see. One of the things that I have done, uh, because of course that doesn't address the fact that then when you purchase yarn for me, I then have to ship it to you. And generally Canada Post is, they do some land and they do some air. Um, what I have done is all of my packing materials from my, I vacuum seal um, many of my products to make it less costly for shipping. Everything, my packing tape, my um, envelopes, my boxes, everything is either paper so that can be recycled, or it is um, PLA-based um, compostable and biodegradable um, plastic, I put that in quotations, um, because it's made from corn. Corn is usually the source, sometimes it's grass. Um, so even my packing tape is made from that because I just cannot, cannot stand putting more plastic out there. Plastic has a purpose. I think its purpose is syringes and um, personal safety equipment and all sorts of things. But if I can 
don't have to ship my beautiful wool products in plastic. That's a, a cost that I am willing to, to take on as a business. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Margaret says, um, with respect to the comment, at least it's not coming from China, we would also need to look at the carbon footprint of shipping from Shanghai to China, although I completely understand your perspective of the carbon footprint of shipping across Canada. And generally, if it's coming from Shanghai to Canada, it's coming as sea freight. So uh, you can take that four kilograms and double it approximately. Um, still a fraction of what air freight is. And then Karen is asking about mills and it's a solution to open the mill types that you've talked about. Um, why is the Canadian government and environmental groups not pressured them to do something about it? Um, I think this is something that the Campaign for Wool deals with on a regular basis. And I think from my perspective, it, we haven't proved the model. Um, right now, Canadian wool isn't sustainable. Um, for example, if I get one of those skeins of yarn that has been sent from Australia to Shanghai and back to North America, cost to me to buy that skein of yarn undyed is between six and seven dollars. Cost to me to get my barn swallow, my barn swallow soft yarn that get made in the mills in Ontario. Um, so it's 100% Canadian. It's made from two small flocks, mixed breed flocks and um, mohair from a lower uh, Wellington Clybert's own mohair goats. Cost to me delivered is about 17 to $18 undyed, which is three times the cost of merino wool from Australia. And so generally what happens with those of us who are indie dyers is you take that base cost, you multiply it by two, it gets you, that gives you the wholesale cost that you can wholesale to the yarn stores, you multiply it by three, and that's the cost that you're selling retail to consumers. So I am selling my barn swallow soft yarn for $32 a skein, or people are selling merino nylon sock yarn, superwash sock yarn, um, produce grown in Australia, milled in China for $36 a skein. That is the, yeah. So we haven't proven the economic model yet. It's not that it's not worthy of doing, but I just don't see how the, any business, any investor could look at those numbers and say, this is a really good idea. <laughs> And it's not because people are trying, not trying. We're all really trying. But if you want investment, you have to improve, you have to prove that the business model is worth it. And we're, I just don't think we're there yet. I think it's going to take some time and it's going to take some real creativity to prove that, yeah. And that's, so it's not a quick fix. I think that there, it's going to be a fix. I think we're going to get there but I just don't think that we're there yet. The other thing is, like I said before, for the average knitter who has never known anything other than Merino commercially produced yarn, the jump from that to say my barn swallow sock yarn is a big leap. Barn swallow sock yarn is beautiful. I sell lots of it, I love it, but it is A, not cons as consistent, B, not as soft, and soft is still king emperor god in the wool world <laughs> um that's what everybody prizes soft is the yeah i know bobby but i'm talking about the general population not those of us who are converted <laughs> um they will put that over every other factor first soft is what people want and like i say soft is not what i want i like my socks to last <laughs> So there's an education component, component that has to go into it, which is why I'm here, which is why all of you are here, which is why we're all talking and trying to convert people, but it's not a quick fix. That's, at least that's my perspective. Thank you. Um, Ellen just made a point that air shipping like air travel produces a huge carbon footprint compared to rail or sea footprints. Yeah. Um, Karen, asks what organization, group, or whomever would be responsible for educating and attempting to change farms in Canada over to the cleaner feed system to produce cleaner fleeces? Right now, I don't think there is any. I think some of the work that the Campaign for Wool um, are doing is 
we're, we're working on, I'm working on a project with Jane right now, um, where we're beginning to put those policies into place, but right now there, there is none. Um, traditionally, wool in Canada um, isn't valued because the wool co-op pays them 60 cents on the pound. It costs them more for farms to buy the bags to put their wool in than it does, um, than what they're actually getting paid for it. So it's rare that I'm getting, I'm working with fiber fleeces or fiber flocks that are putting values in. They are definitely the minority. Um, and most of the flocks I work with are 30, 40, 50, 60 head. Um, I'm hoping in time I'm, I'm going to be able to work with the flocks that are a thousand head. That's where that's where the need, needle will really be will be able to move it forward in terms of preserving the wool in Canada. Um, not the small producers are already doing a good job. It's those big flocks that are raising for meat that um, right now could care less. And a thousand head of sheep say each one produces a fleece of 10 pounds that is a lot of wool that's not getting used um so i think that was it for the questions or comments one last call i'll give it a minute but i think we're good um otherwise if you did want to do the wool looking at under a microscope i really want to do that i was kind of interested <laughs> in not, that it's not under a microscope it's just under oh, okay but i can talk about it. okay <laughs> Um, if people want to hang around, I'm happy to hang around and do that. Um, I know that pe people also have busy lives, mm -hmm. so I will not take offense if you all have to pop off. I know, Matthew, mm -hmm. you probably have to go, right? Yeah, I have a call, a call coming up, but I figured we could, if we could, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. It, like, I don't want to keep anyone from, from seeing the wool. <laughs> um, Karen just asked if I ever thought about opening a mill myself. Honestly, I have, um, but I don't really think it's. I don't think it's where I can best serve the industry, where I hope to be able to go with my work is going out to the farms and actually working on the farms. That seems to be um, working with actual farmers. That seems to be A, where I'm happy, <laughs> happiest, um, and B, um, you know, doing the small production that I do where I'm dying in my garage, which will soon be my workshop. Um, it's just not, there's a lot of great dyers in Canada. I think we've got that covered. Where what we don't have covered is people working directly with the shepherds on improving the quality of the clip. And I don't mean that in terms of people don't have that knowledge. It's just that people aren't there on the ground. Now, whether I can turn that into a viable business, I don't know. Um, I'm also working on some supply stuff. I've got some projects going on. Some of you may have seen that I'm working in collaboration with Sweet Paprika Yarn on a yarn collect a yarn subscription box. We're not able to do Canadian yarn for most of it because we just can't get the price points we need. But hopefully down the road, as those kind of relationships develop, we will, and we can do more of that kind of stuff where I'm working with people who can't get to the farms, who can't, don't have the space to store a hundred pounds of fleece, um, that kind of thing. So we'll see, we'll see what, where it goes. Uh, okay, now let me see if I can make my technology work here. Um, <laughs> so we use, the trick. Okay, so I'm just gonna switch to my other camera. Can you see that everybody? The other camera with the lock and the measurement? Yeah, that's great. Okay, and then I'm gonna share screen. And in begin. Everybody still see that? I'm gonna see if I can get more focus here. Hang on, it helps if I don't move the camera while I'm trying to focus it. Okay, maybe, does it, is that blurry for everyone? It's fine. Bit, it's fine? It, yeah. Okay. So this is a lock of wool that I happen to have in my desk. I suspect this is Wensleydale, but I'm not entirely certain because I literally found it in my desk and used it as, let's set this up as our model. Um, the reason why I suspect it's Wensleydale is I can tell by looking at it, it's a long wool of some variety. So the staple is about six inches, a little bit more than six inches. And it's got a crimp structure that I can see is what we call a pearl. Um, so crimp comes in a whole variety of forms. Let me put another one beside it so you can see a different crimp structure. And I'm just gonna change the exposure to see if you can see that a bit better. So this is, there, that's a bit better. Um, unfortunately with the long wool, long wools are known as luster wools and they're shiny. And so it's picking up some of the reflection of the light, but you hopefully can see that other little sample. 
that is Ryland from the UK. So Ryland is a down breed. And it has what is a true crimp, true, what we would call a true crimp, whereas the long wool has a pearl structure. And they call it pearls because it looks like um, what happens when you undo your knitting, that kinky. Um, anybody who's unknitted something knows it, the yarn will be all kinky and ramen noodle-ish. And um, you don't see that pearl structure in fine wools or medium wools. You see more like this structure where it's a whole bunch of little crazy crimpy bits. Um, the reason why crimp is really important to the work I do is it determines how a yarn is going, how a wool will get spun. So when you spin, you're putting twist into the fiber and the, the crimp structure determines the number of twists per inch. So on this one here, this long wool, you can see that it's maybe one to two crimps per inch, whereas this little guy here, like a bazillion crimps per inch. So with the long wool, it means that I can't put a lot of twist in and twist is what gives yarn its integrity. So for this one, I, it would have to be spun loosely, otherwise it would turn into wire and no one wants to wear wire or weave with wire. And so ideally that would get put into probably a thicker yarn that doesn't have as much twist or a really carefully managed yarn, uh, finer yarn. Um, hand spinners can do this by really managing twist um, because the staple, staple length also plays a part. Now, this staple is probably too long to send to any can mill in Canada. Most of the mills in Canada can handle three to, three to six inches. Um, and this is pushing the limit. If I sent it to one of the mills I usually use, like Wellington Fiber, they would try spinning it and they'd probably put it into a single ply thick yarn um, that doesn't require a lot of twist, but is relying on the length of that staple to, to keep the yarn um, held together. Whereas this little one here, you can see its staple length is about two inches. Where I could send this is to Custom Woolen Mills. So Custom Woolen Mills is in Alberta, they do true woolen spun yarn. So they, they process to carded wool and then they have a mule spinner. And if you've never seen a mule spinner in action, it is something to behold because they spin in a really different way than most of our, most of our commercial spinning mills now. Um, there are only a few of them left. I, there's one, I think Batten Kill in the United States is a mule, mule spun mill. Um, it's ideal for these short staple fibers because it's the preparation, the roving that actually holds them together. And with all this crimp, all, this, all those little wavy bits, you can put a lot of twist into it and not have a yarn that's really gnarly and uncomfortable. So for a wool like this, I would say I want a lightweight yarn. Um, so 16 to 18 wraps per inch. That's one way that mills talk about yarns. Um, They'll also talk about it, yarns in terms of near meterage, worst account, um, yarns per pound, yards per pound. There's a whole bunch of different ways that mills talk about yarns, but for knitters, fingering weight. Um, so sort of you know, 400 yards per 100 grams, for, uh, 380 meters per 100 grams. And so fine, lots of twist. And one of the things about this is you can see if I, you can see the nice bounce on that. So this is a really elastic yarn. That also plays an important factor. And that's why these down breeds are really, really great for soft yarn. They're naturally elastic. Whereas this, you can see it just doesn't have the same elasticity. It's really, really strong. And so these type of wools were traditionally used for warp yarns in weaving. In fact, um, the whole entire medieval British wool trade was built on these types of wools. They used to be the king in wools, whereas these little guys were, and these sheep, when I say these little guys, these sheep are small. Um, they're sturdy little, they look like little potato sheep. They're awfully cute, <laughs> um, but they were meat sheep mostly. Now, the fact that they have nice wool bonus because people saw this elasticity and thought underpants <laughs> and down breeds were used it's like Ryland and South Down were traditionally used for making knitted undergarments. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to be part of the Canadian wool industry, knitted underpants. <laughs> now I'm just going to switch this up here. So this 
is a walk from Ewan's Fleece. Ewan is that Beaumont Merino that I showed you the picture of, the guy with the fabulous horns. So he's actually not Canadian, he's British. You can see he's got a really, really fine crimp structure. This is not a particularly long staple, it's just about three inches. So a three inch staple could go either way. You could spin it worsted or you could spin it woolen. But one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you and squeeze is for something called a ping test. Now, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. I'm gonna hold this lock up to my microphone and pull, tug it. Uh, maybe I can get a little bit closer. Hang on a second. Can you hear that little whooping sound? So that whooping sound is called a ping test. And that is a sign that this is a very, very strong fiber. So I'm just gonna show you what I was doing. Oh, it's really whooping now. And that strength, so if I pull on it, you can see it's just not going anywhere, is, a, is an indication that that fiber is sound and it can handle basically anything I can throw at it. This is one of the reasons why I'm really interested in these Beaumont Merinos is because Merino has reputation of not being a particularly strong fiber. This stuff, this is really, really strong. <laughs> For a fine wool, it's quite incredible. Now, the other thing that um, mills will do to test strength, whether they can process it, is something called a crackle test. And a crackle test is holding this uh, lock like this up to the ear and pulling it and listening for crackling noises. The crackling noises are fibers breaking. And so ideally what you want is a crackle test where you don't hear that noise or just very, very little. And that's also an indication of how it's going to handle in the fiber process. Are those fibers gonna to get torn apart and broken? Broken fibers will are what turn into your pills on your sweater. They get pulled out of your, your yarn um, structure and undermine the integrity. And that's where you'll get holes, weak spots, um, in socks, toes poking through, that kind of thing. So this is a really big part of what I'm looking at when I'm looking at fleeces and making fleece selection. What are the staple lengths? How strong is that fiber? If a sheep has been weak, this fiber would not do that. Or if sheep has been ill, that this fiber would not do this. It would just pull, pull apart and you act, would actually see like a little divot in the fiber. I was looking for, I have a couple of wheat fleeces that I've held on to for teaching purposes, but as we're moving, they're packed. So I'm sorry, I can't put them to you. Now, all three of these are nice clean fleeces. You don't see any vegetable matter, nothing. They're beautiful. It means when I send them for processing, the mill is not gonna yell at me for sending them a dirty fleece. This is what I don't want to see. <laughs> this is a dirty, dirty fleece. Um, and there's actually two problems with this fleece. So I just pulled this out of the bag and you can see that this is, cold, well, actually there's quite a few problems. This is just under coat um, and it's actually a broken lock. And I suspect if I pull on it, yeah, just pulls right apart. So this is a weak fleece. Um, indicates that the animal has been under some sort of stress. It's not necessarily illness, it could be nutrients. Um, on Vancouver Island, we have a real problem with selenium deficiencies. Um, and so often farmers will have to supplement for selenium and if they haven't been or if they haven't been enough, um, it can show up in the fleece. If the animal's been sick, if they sometimes, if they've been pregnant, um, there's a whole different range and environmental stress. If the flock has been attacked by a predator, it can show up in the fleece. If it's been a really bad season with something like a heat dome, that can show up in the fleece. The other problem with this fleece is the staple length. Now, this is not even the whole thing. If I fold it in half, <laughs> you can see that folded in half, it's about six inches. And the problem with that is no mill is going to be able to process that length of fleece. Now, a hand spinner like me can, whether I would want to with this amount of vegetable matter is another thing. Often I find that people sell fleeces to hand spinners that are really dirty, assuming because they're a hand spinner, oh, well, they can just take all the dirt out. Hand spinners don't want that. <laughs> we don't have time. Processing fleeces by hand is a lengthy, lengthy process. And while I love doing it, and I may do it for this fleece because this fleece is an interesting one. This is a cross between a Scottish black face and a blue face Lester. Um, I may do it for this fleece because it is interesting to me and I may do some experiments. Any mill would look at this and just put it right in the garbage. If they thought it was worth processing, they might contact the person who sent it in and say, can we cut it? And 
cutting is literally just taking scissors and cutting that block in half so that their equipment can process it. It's not ideal because as you can see, the tip of this lock is quite a bit different than the base. That would all get blended in. Um, but it is one option if you're really determined to have this particular fleece because it came from some special sheep um, processed at a mill, they could cut that. Um, but in this case, uh, this is a fleece that I bought online during COVID and it was not presented in a way that I could see this vegetable matter. What the person had done is rolled the really dirty part into the center of the fleece and hadn't taken honest pictures. And this happens quite a bit. Um, and unfortunately for this person, what this means is I will never go back to them and I will never recommend them to anybody. So it's a thing that farmers sometimes forget is the fleece community is small. We hand spinners tend to talk amongst ourselves because if we find a really good source, we like sharing those really good sources, unless it's a secret source. I have a couple of secret sources. Um, but this is never a farmer that like this, this should not have been sold to anybody. This is garbage fleece. And this has been washed. That's the other thing. I have washed this because I wanted to see how much it would come out. And some, uh, some of the dirt already came out. If you look at my piece of paper, <laughs> that's not great. Um, one of the misconceptions with farmers is they think that that will get taken care of in the milling process. And as a rule of thumb, what you send in is what you get out. Carding will not take care of vegetable matter and contaminants. Combing can take care of some of it, but like I said, we don't have mills that do combing in Canada. Pin drafting is a different stage of it, and it will take some of that out. But I, any, if I sent this to a mill, I would get an angry email or an angry phone call. And I value the relationships in my mills too much to do that sort of thing. Um, Another type of lock structure, this comes from Violet. This is the type of lock structure that makes my heart pitter patter. These beautiful little ringletty curls. So one of the markets for fleeces like this is actually not to people like me. If it was a little bit longer, I would say to this, this shepherd, look for felters. So felters um, often will use locks like this in art installations, art weavings, um, things like sort of like the Scandinavian Viking style coats and boas, that kind of thing. This would need to be a little bit longer for that. But on shearing day on Barnston Island, one of the people who comes is a woman named Chantel who is an art felter. She does art installations and she takes all the britch and belly. So all the poopy stuff, all the stuff that I don't want, she takes it and she uses it in her felting um, artwork. And it's astounding. It's absolutely gorgeous. She makes um, like wall hangings and lampshades and all sorts of cool things. And it's a great use for wool that otherwise would be going to waste. For me, when I see this, I think, oh, <laughs> I want to keep it and spin it. And I try not to do that much anymore. Um, I always, if I'm going to keep a fleece for myself, it has to be small because I just don't get the time to hand process as much. Um, this will be going into, I think, pin drafted roving for hand spinners. I think that's what I decided to do with this. And you can see there's a teeny weeny little mint bit of moss right there. And that's about as dirty as the Burnson Island fleeces get. That little bit of moss. Easy to pick out, it'll probably fall out in the carding process. Um, occasionally on the West Coast, we'll get brambles, um, blackberry brambles or rose hips, that kind of stuff stuck in. But one of the luxuries of what we know here on the island is we have pastures that are relatively free of things like burrs, um, cleavers, things that'll stick to wool. This is also from that same flock, and this is a different type of uh, crimp structure. So for this one, really super crimpy. This is ideal for a lightweight wool. I can't remember if I'm doing wool with this. I suspect it's going to go into spinning fiber. Um, spinners, this is one that you'll want to get your hands on. It's from a sheep named TBD because we haven't determined the sheep's name yet. Um, and TBD has CVM in its um, heritage. That's where you get all this little these little curls and you can just see from the pile here it's quite bouncy so that bounciness is what we call loft 
loft is the property of wool that traps air. And the loftier the wool, the more air is trapped, the better insulation. That's why wool and spun yarns are so great because they are warmer. Um, I heard someone once say that wool and spun yarns weren't as warm because they had lots of spaces between the fibers, which is not true. All those spaces between the fibers where it, is where it traps air and that's where you get the insulating properties from. Um, CVMs, turn this over here, um, are the nice short name for California variegated mutant, which is a terrible name for a breed of sheep. But what the mutant refers to is the fact that you'll get all these different colors within one um, sheep fleece. The other name for CVMs is Rommeldale. It's from the same sheep breed. They're classified together now, the CVMs and the Rommeldales. And Rommeldales are solid, so you don't get this variation of color within the same sheep breed. And often you actually see a variation in fiber, you get these nice little crimpy bits. And then these ones that are, you can see the crimp is a little less distinct. I'll get it blended together because it's all fine enough, but some people, if you're a hand spinner, prefer to separate those bits out and process them by hand separately. Um, what this will turn into is a really nice heathered yarn. I'm really excited to getting this one back. I kind of suspect I might've put it out for myself, but it's probably gonna go back in the processing <laughs> to be processed file. Um, I often do that. I'll pull one out because I really, really like it. And think, oh, that'll be beautiful to spin but I just don't get as much time to spin these days. So yes, keep an eye out for TBD. That's gonna be a beautiful fleece when it comes back. Really, really soft. Um, Romandel fleeces are, and CVMs are still relatively hard to find in the hand spinning market, and especially hard to find in the yarn market um, because for a long time, the entire U.S. clip, and they are, they are an American-developed breed, the entire U.S. clip was bought by Pendleton's. You could not buy um, Rommeldale or CVN on the open market. Now, let me just play with exposure so you can see this pile of beautifulness here. So this is one of the reasons um, I like working with the Barnston Island flock. Brandywine was a lamb from last year, and so Susan and I talked about who we were going to breed to who. And Brandywine um, is the lamb that came from, oh, I have to double check. It's either Papageno or Oliver. Those were the two rams that Susan was breeding with last year. And you can see this is a very crimpy and it's really dark. That's why I really had to put the exposure up and I'm just gonna turn that over so you're not getting blinded by the reflection. Um, it's a very, very dark, um, brown fleece, it's going to be probably close to black once I get it processed. It is very fine and it's got a beautiful crimp structure. And so with a crimp structure like this, um, when it's consistent throughout the fleece, it just makes it that much easier to get a consistent yarn. If most fleeces will have some inconsistencies in it, so around um, the bottom of the legs, the neck, the neck is always finer, the back end, the bridge, that's always coarser. Um, but when you get a fleece like this, where it's really consistent, it makes it easy to get it processed. The mill will have a lovely time with this, processing this one. Um, and you'll get a much more consistent finished product. And I cannot wait to get this one back. And get it in, bit in focus so you can see those beautiful crimps um, and you can see along the length of the lock like this little one that's sticking out here it's crimpy from tip to butt that's what you'd like to see in a fiber now it has bleached out a little bit um, all natural blacks will tend to do that they call them fading blacks the only non-fading black sheep that i'm aware of is the black welsh mountain and we do have some of those in canada but it is very short stable kind of scratchy it's definitely a coarser wool um, the black sheep that we do have will tend to have this happen where they'll go a little bit golden on the ends. And so the yarn will tend to run a little bit browner as, true, as opposed to a true black. True black's really rare in nature because the only way you get true black is when you actually have no light. And so any true black, any black yarn is going to be some degree of brown, just depending on how dark that brown is. So these are all little samples that I'm preparing to send off to the lab in Montana State. Oh, and you can see right here, that's a second cut. So that, that little bit there, is what you don't want in your fleece. And it happens. Um, odds are, because I'm sending this to a mill that did, does pin drafting, that would have gotten taken out by the pin drafter. 
but that is the little bits that you don't want that's left over because the shear just went over a little bit. Something this small is really hard to get um, when you're skirting because it's tiny. And that was just fluke that I saw it there. And you can sometimes get it in lambs fleeces because like babies, um, you know, baby hair starts off super, super fine and super soft. And as it grows, it turns more into what their childhood hair will be. And it's the same with lambs. Lambs will start with a, a fiber that's much different than their actual coat once their coat has grown in over a couple months. So that could just be a little bit of lamb or a transition between lamb fleece into their adult fleece, which will be different again. Um, in your wool, you also can sometimes get other types of fibers. So wool is not always just this, this beautiful fiber. Sometimes you can get camp, which is a brittle white fiber that will break and won't take dye. Some, and that's common in more sheep breeds than others. Sometimes you'll get a dual coated fleece and this fellow here could be dual coated. That could be why I'm getting got all this fluffy short stuff along with this super long stuff. And dual coated means they'll have an undercoat that's generally super, super fine. And then this long coat that is wiry and hairy. And you'll see this in Icelandics and Shetlands. And traditionally what um, they would do is separate the outer coat and the undercoat. Undercoat would be made for garments. Uh, um, outer coat would be used for things like sails because it's really coarse. And um, yeah, not something you would want on your skin. So it's for sails, warp yarn, things that require lots and lots of strength. It's really more akin to twine when you spin it than what we are used to in the knitting world. And I'm just looking to see if I have anything else to show you. I think that was it. I'm always hoping that there'll be shepherds where I can show them like this. Don't send me this. <laughs> the stuff that I've had show up in boxes of fleece. Um, this is not the worst of it. I've had binder twine, hooves, keds. Keds are a type of bug. It's like um, sheep um, ticks, sheep ticks. They're horrible. They're gross. <laughs> um, they suck blood from the sheep and we, you, you do see them in fleeces and they're disgusting and don't send me keds, please. Um, yeah, it's a poop. I've been shipped a lot of poop. Don't send me poop in the mail not ideal. <laughs> um, it's often surprising me to me this considering how some of these boxes that I receive smell that they actually made it through the mail. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, always an interesting day when you get a box from someone who doesn't use their, their wool for anything and wants me to take a look at it. And what am I going to find this time? Hooves has been the worst. I've heard people get cigarette butts. I have not had that Oh, maybe I had it once. I think I had it once. You know, someone was smoking on shearing day and that's what I got in the mail. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, now. Um, so yeah, that's a little sampling of some of the things that I see. Some of the things I don't want to see. <laughs> and yeah, does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up? You guys have all been so patient and handy <laughs> here with me. It's amazing. <laughs> Wool geeks, I love it. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't. Do you want to turn the camera back on to you? Because we're oh, just so. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Melissa, for reminding me. There we go. That should do. It. Okay, great. And just to wrap it up, thank you so much, Catherine. We're we were so excited to have you here and to talk so much. Um, on such a granular level about thing like properties of wool that we might not think about, um, suppliers, um, transparency throughout the supply chain. So thank you so much. Um, she's been a longtime supporter of the campaign for wool um, and we love having her be a part of it. So thank you so much. Well, and thank you for having me and thank you for all of you sticking her. <laughs> you know, the wool geeks unite, right? <laughs> So have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much, Alyssa, for sticking around and chatting a little with us. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Mm -hmm.